Welcome at my presentation, Layout on your Workspace version 2.0. I would like to thank Safe Software for giving me the opportunity to share my story with you, and I would like to thank you for being here at my presentation. Today, we're going to take a tour on the subject of how to lay out your workspace and have, some, uh, have a look at some best practices. My name is Lars de Vries, and I'm the owner of a small Dutch company called Omkere, which translates in turnaround. And we help customers to resolve their data issues and support them in trying to get more out of their data. I work with FME for 12 years right now, and I'm both certified professional and certified trainer. Building a workspace never goes as planned. You always run into unexpected scenarios and need extra transformers and inventive solutions. So it's like taking a roller coaster ride. It always takes an unexpected turn. The other side where you can run into is that you've built a workspace for half a year ago or maybe two years ago, and a customer ch asks you to change something. Then you open the workspace and you're just looking into what's where. And that's also a challenge by itself. So why do you want to apply a structured layout to your workspace? Because you want to be recognizable. Well, no, but it is a pleasant side effect. No. What is important is that a good layout and a good setup helps you with building and structurizing your workspace. It gives a clear view of what is where and makes it easier to track your issues. It simplifies your view and it also makes your workspace more readable. Today, we're going to look into some of the most important attractions of your FME workspace. We're going to visit the bookmarks, the annotation, the connection lines, and in the end, we also discuss some naming conventions. Often, I introduce myself as a storyteller, and that is exactly what happens when you apply bookmarks correctly in your workspace. Your bookmarks tell a story, and they do that by using chapters, and each chapter tells a bit of the whole. Like the chapters in a book, you can give them numbers, and by following those numbers, you get the order of the story or you can compare it with Google Maps or your navigation system. And it gives step-by-step -step instructions how the data goes through your workspace and gets to the end result. You can also look at them as a management report when you're developing your workspace. By collapsing your bookmark during development, you only get the results of the last transformer or last transformer. That is, it stores the features that go through the output ports of your bookmark. It does not store the intermediate results, to which it would do when the bookmarks are opened. Within the FME options, it's possible to create different appearances for your bookmarks. Each bookmark can be given a name and be used accordingly. When you use the overview window in your workbench, you can see your workspace as a map. The different appearances of the bookmarks directly show what's happening where in your workspace. It shows, for example, where reading take, takes place or where error logging or reporting takes place. This can be particularly interesting because there are more and more options to read and write within a transformer and data can come into your workspace at any place. It can also show, for example, where your workspace isn't finished or as when you're developing where parts are ready and where work still ne needs to be done. Annotations in a workspace can be seen as the text balloons in a comic. They support the story, but they don't repeat what can already be seen in the image already. To add relevance to those annotations, I created different types of annotations. For example, I created annotations for remarks, for some great ideas that can improve your workspace or ideas that should be developed at a later stage. And I also created some different annotations for development. For example, questions that need to be answered, things that still need to be done, but also bugs that are present in your workspace. And of course, I also use the regular annotations within the bookmarks for additional comments. And like the bookmarks, 
Each annotation adds value by telling a story. I do this by following a set of rules. For example, I commit to why is something happening in a transformer or a bookmark instead of what is happening. Often with bookmarks, I give a small summary of what's happening there, giving a total overview of each step. I also use a lot of color in my annotations to reference elements that are present in my workspace. For example, purple for parameters that can be found in the navigator pane, greenish brown to reference attributes. Sometimes I do tell what is happening instead of only telling why something is happening, because it's just important to know that, for example, a writer truncates the data first before it's being written. You can see that like a kind of a warning that something is happening that's really impacting your data. When you just always insert your data, that might not be particularly interesting to know. But when you're updating your data, that might be interesting to know. And it might also be interesting to know when you insert your data that you're truncating your data set first. So the actual data that's living in your data set will be lost. When I reference elements in an annotation, I'm not always strict with color because some colors blend with the background color and they can't be recognized anymore very well or they can't be read very well. In that case, I try to stay in the same gradient. So attributes are still greenish and transformers will be bluish. This way, they always can be read easily. But this way, annotations can be of great help in documenting your workspace and making your workspace easy to understand. When you lay out your workspace in a standardized way, it has some positive side effects. Not only you're having fun building a workspace for a client, but you can also have, have fun reading your own workspace with another workspace. So how can this be helpful? Well, you can read your workspace through three different readers. Well, probably more, but I found three really helpful. That is reading the workspace with the workspace reader, the text file reader, or the XML reader. You can think of many different applications using those readers. Each has its own advantages, but some examples that I try to use them for are creating documentation, issue tracking. You saw that I use some special characters in my annotations for development. Well, you could read them and, for example, synchronize them. This gives you the opportunity to track bugs, changes, and other important elements of your workspace. For small workspaces, this might not be as interesting, but especially for large workspaces, this could be very interesting, or in a scenario where you're developing a workspace with multiple people. I already told how the bookmarks and the annotations can support the story your workspace is telling. You can do this by changing the style of your connection lines. This way, it's possible to put an emphasis on the main data flow in your workspace, it is the red line of your story. But you can also put an emphasis on other parts of the data flow, for example, reporting or error processes. Not only can you change the thickness and the color of the line, but you can also apply different line styles. Besides thickness and color, there are two other options that can be changed in the visualization of connection lines. One is the line type, and the other one is the shape of lines. The shape of the line is currently a personal setting, but I think it would be helpful when you could set that to a workspace. Even though I was a great supporter of the possibility to change the style of your connection lines, I still think it's a great feature. I barely seem to use it in reality. I think it has to do that I'm so accustomed using the standard styles that it's just not in my system yet, but that things might change in the future. I think the connection lines can still be improved. Just one aspect, and that's adding arrow markers to it. Very helpful when two lines are crossing each other or when a connection line goes into the wrong direction. When that happens, it would be helpful to see, oh, that one goes from the right to the left instead of left to the right, what's regular. Another thing that people are not accustomed to is standardizing names. What I see happening often is people use file names like export one, export two. This one is better. Final, final two, final, final. This could be for a workspace name 
or a file name that's output of some process. It's easy to get lost with all those different names, and therefore it's good to have some naming conventions for your workspaces, for your output files, but also for your web connections and your database connections. For those last two, for example, in my organization, I used the convention of first naming the format, then the organization, and as last, I used the username. That way, it's always easy to find the user connection that is used, not only on desktop, but particularly also on server and FME Cloud. There are many applications for naming conventions, not only web and database connections, but also workspaces, files, directories, or transformers. Although, personally, I have a preference not to rename transformers. And otherwise, it might be hard for someone else to understand your workspace quickly. Recently, I found out that putting the version in your workspace name also has some disadvantages. For example, using the workspace runner, and also when you upload your workspace to FME server or to FME cloud. Within a workspace runner, you will also have to reference this new workspace. The effect will be that all your parameters set for that workspace runner will be reset. So I chose to move the version to the history part of the workspace parameters. This way, the version is stored within the workspace. You can still save a copy of your workspace, but on the same name. I even build a workspace that copies the workspace and only replaces the part of the history and added a new version. The copy was stored in a different folder. I tried with the system caller to open the workspace, but that didn't finish the workspace and left the workspace open, even resulting sometimes in the deletion of all the files that were in that folder. That didn't really make me happy, so I quit doing that quickly. In the past, I distinguished between a main version and a development version. For the development version, I added a character to the main version. However, I noticed that the version number didn't tell anything about the changes made to the workspace. So I decided to apply a different numbering. Now I distinct between a main version, which is used for the releases, a subversion when I change transformers, and a detailed version for relatively small bug fixes and parameter settings. For the first development of a workspace, I still use version 000 with the addition of a character. That is because so many things can change in the first development, that's not really interesting to distinguish between all those different parts, adding, removing readers, writers, transformers, and changing parameter settings. I think that's only, that becomes really relevant when you publish the workspace or when you share the workspace with others. The workspace you're looking at right now already seems to be quite structured. I mean, I have seen workspaces where lines go everywhere, transformers are not lined out, and everything is everywhere on the canvas. What is missing is the reference to the elements by using a color for those. So when I take the next step and I apply most of the suggestions I've made in this presentation, my workspace will start looking like something like this. So here I applied colors to reference certain elements in my workspace. I applied bookmarks. So you see the different steps that are taken, the sections within my workspace. Additionally, I could have tried to add some small annotations to the bookmarks, giving a summary, but I tried to do that in the titles already. The bookmarks that have a green color clearly display where data is being read and the bookmark with the pink color shows where data is written. This way, the data flow can easily be seen. It's very easy to set your own rules for layouting your workspace, but I would recommend to do this within your organization and to discuss this with colleagues and coworkers. It's not only important to discuss how you lay out the workspace, but also to think about the way you name your workspaces, where you store them, how you apply names to database connections and web connections, how you name your output, where you store your output. I would suggest to document the choices you make and why you made those choices. You could also store a template file for your bookmarks. As you've seen, there are many ways to create a structurized layout and to apply best practices to your workspace. Applying those best practices to your workspace will help you building your workspace, structurize your workspace, tell the story that needs to be told, simplify issue tracking, 
and it makes it readable as ABC. To give you a head start, I made a template file that's available on the Hub. I really love a good readable workspace with many colors to clarify what's happening, but watch out and don't go Kandinsky style. I mean, he's a great artist, but for workspace, it might be a bit too much. For now, I hope you really enjoyed this roller coaster ride, and I would like to thank you for your attention, and I wish you much fun at all the other attractions you can find at the FME World Fair 2021. Bye bye! Hi, and welcome to the presentation FME Governance How to Structure the Use and Growth of Your FME Environment. Uh, my name is Leslie McKenzie. I'm Director of Innovation, Technology and Strategy at Concert Tech Solutions, and I will be giving you this presentation today. Um, the objective of today's presentation is seeing FME as an enterprise application. And really, what are those considerations and questions that you ask yourself when you're planning the implementation of FME server? in an organization. And this can be a small FME server or it could be a large FME server. Um, the idea, the message I want to pass today is that you really have to like um, learn how to evolve and scale um, to the needs. Um, this is a quote that I really like. There is enough room in the sandbox for all the castles, but we have to agree on how to share the sand. Um, the idea being that we'll touch a lot of points on governance and how to sort of agree to all use the FME server and how to sort of, um, you know, manage our content. Um, so today's um, agenda, I'm going to start with an introduction. What are the challenges? What are the benefits of governance? What are the elements of a plan for governance and implementation? And what are the different questions and considerations? So a short history. Um, I've been working with FME since uh, 2005 and I've been working with FME server since um, I believe it's 2008. I've uh, been installing it for a long time, been helping organizations implement it, small organizations, large organizations. And in the early years of um, FME, uh, FME sort of grew organically in a lot of organizations. So what does that mean? We started by doing a few things. Those few things caught on and we had some they had some successes and they added more things and more things and more things. So there wasn't really a methodology for how to use FME. It just kind of got used where it was best, you know, solving a problem. Um, so it kind of grew organically and heroically in a way, and it tended to be managed by only a few individuals. OK, so normally we wouldn't even have a whole department using it. We would have like a couple of people in a GIS department who were using uh, FME and FME server then would get adopted by those who had been using FME desktop for a long time and just needed more. And so then they would get FME server. So, you know, FME server adoption tended to be by organizations who had been using FME for a long time. And like I said, there tended to be a little organization of content in those early years, either using desktop or server. Uh, what did this lead to? Uh, several organizational challenges. So for those who already had FME and let it kind of grow um, organically, uh, we tended to see some quality control issues. So, you know, you end up with sort of content named all kinds of things. Um, duplicate processes, so the same FME workspace more than one time with slight different variations and different things people were testing, but they can't remember what they were. And, um, you know, I have I've, I've more than one time, I've many times sat down with somebody and literally had to go through all of their content and try to decipher, you know, which which content was still good, which was, you know, which workspaces were being called by schedules. Um, which um, maybe public, you know, um, publications, which subscribers and the notification service were maybe orphaned or were still getting utilized. Um, and the processes themselves sometimes were difficult to read because they were sort of developed, you know, in an ad hoc way, sort of any which way, which did the job at the beginning. But later on, you know, when you have like five workspaces, it's one thing when you have like 300 workspaces, it's not the same thing anymore. Uh, the other thing, uh, challenge staff turnover. So, you know, um, FME server has now been around long enough that there's likely been staff turnover. Um, this is a normal thing. 
and um, you know, uh, you know, so so the people managing these processes are not the people who originally wrote them or implemented them. Uh, inefficient scheduling and engine management. This is due to different reasons. Sort of like when you have, you know, the whole FME server wide open and available to you, you sort of like spread the schedules out and kind of any which way. And um, and sometimes like to you know leaving you know medium sized gaps between schedules, but this also limits what you can fit between two schedules. And you know some of it was also because you know there there weren't as many options for prioritization and job changing chaining as there is now in FME Server. So you know some people would run one workspace at 1 a.m. and then run the next one at 1:15, just to be 100% sure that workspace one completed at 1 a.m. before workspace two started, but that would leave a weird processing gap. And then you had to be trying to fit different workspaces between these different gaps. And and um, and so it became a little bit more cumbersome and complex to do that when there's a lot of them. Uh, permissions and security were not things that were greatly looked at at the beginning. So these became increasingly issues. And then migration becomes increasingly challenging. When you don't really know what your FME server is doing, it's hard to predict what impact migration might have. Um, the other thing is some organizations, you know, had larger, more complex FME servers now, so it became more, more complex to migrate, and there's more considerations to take into account, more people using it. Now we need a migration plan. We need to go to production plan. We need to know how we're going to do it. Even if it's not a huge endeavor, it still needs some organization. Um, the other challenges that we're seeing is new organizations uh, adopting FME server faster. Um, you know, automation is becoming more important as a general topic. Um, organizations have more and more, you know, data to manage, um, but the staff is not gr growing proportionately to the data. So, um, you know, you have to do more things automatically and efficiently. Uh, so FME uh, is, def is, is now getting leveraged across an organization as well. So not just, you know, a cut two, one or two people in a GIS department, but maybe different people in different departments with different needs and different priorities um, and different, you know, permissions to data. Um, we're seeing these newer organizations onboard FME server at a much faster rate because of that need for automation, which means they're uptaking both FME desktop and server at the same time, which requires a little bit more planning than when you've been using FME desktop for 10 years and then you finally onboard to FME server. You've mastered FME desktop. You've got to learn both now. Um, we also look at... Um, there's way more deployment options available now. So FME, there's FME Cloud or FME Server. Uh, FME Server could be a containerized version. It could be installed in the cloud. It could be installed on premise on on a VM. Um, there's, you know, now that there's more options, we need to think about matching those options to our needs. So the solution to this is instead of just sort of Installing an FME server really quickly and then trying to figure out what it is, we're trying to approach, we try to approach FME, FME server uh, from an implementation and governance point of view. Um, so what are the main components of a governance and implementation plan? Um, you know, uh, I would say the, you know, we, we sort of divide the three main elements into like technology and people and standards. I put security on the side because security will impact the technology. Security will impact the people and security will impact the standards as well. It'll impact how we use the tool. So all these three things together are really important to get off on the right foot in using my FME server. This is just a different look at the same information where I sort of included also, um, you know, technology versus IT practices. So, you know, we, we, we want to install and configure the technology, but IT practices influence that. And then the most important thing here is also the business needs component, which is why it's sort of separated from the rest of the pie. The business needs are going to drive a lot of what we do technologically, how we, you know, it's going to drive, um, you know, how we interact with the IT practices. It's going to drive the people. It's going to drive the standards. It's going to drive the security as well. So all these things tend to impact each other, though, in 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 some way. So they're all sort of the facets we need to consider when we're we're implementing our FME server. 
So the main question um, I've learned to ask when approaching somebody who's going to install their first FME server is what are you planning on to do with it in the next six to 12 months? So I've picked six to 12 as an example, but it could be the next 24 months. I would say that the average clients are upgrading in the two, two year range. Some upgrade every year, some upgrade every three. I've got a couple that do every four years, but the bigger the delta, the more risky the migration becomes because we actually end up having to analyze the differences between the two version and sort of predict what's gonna happen. Um, so I would say like a, the sweet spot is maybe in the two year range, but you know, often with the first FME server and often for sort of the sake of sanity, it's easier to predict what we're gonna do in the next six to 12 months and then keep re-asking ourselves that question. And I tell people, write, uh, write them out literally, prioritize the projects and look at this as a living document. Um, it's not set in stone. Priorities change, needs change, technologies change, applications change. So we need to learn to keep re-asking ourselves this question so that we can adapt appropriately. Um, again, what we're gonna do with the FME server, that's what's gonna drive how much licensing we need to buy, how much processing are we gonna do? That's gonna impact how many engines I need and what kind of engines I need, dynamic engines, regular engines, where's my FME server gonna live? Do I need to buy cloud infrastructure? Um, how to architect the application? Is it going to be a you know a complex application? Is it going to be a simple application? Um, you know you still need to ask these questions when you have a simple application because even though your first FME server might be a very simple one, if you get into the habit of asking these questions, it will become much easier to scale up later when you need to, um, and then it will impact you know. The, these other facets like how we're going to install and configure. So the key message here is really the business needs are going to drive how we're going to use the FME server and that's really going to drive a lot of the rest of the implementation. So when we look at the technical part of that technical part of the governance plan, the technology part, um, I usually tell people to make an integrations roadmap. So what, what do I put in my integrations roadmap? Again, what projects I want to do. Then we try to identify what kinds of integrations we're going to do. Schedule tasks tend to be easy to predict. So it helps us predict the busyness of our server, uh, the priorities of the processes, on-demand processes, apps, automation. Um, we try to get an idea of what we're going to do with the FME server. Um, and then I just threw a pro tip in here. You need to make a hypothesis sometimes. It's not, sometimes it's pretty easy because all the projects are pretty laid out and we're able to get a pretty like clear idea of what we're going to be doing. But sometimes um, it's a little bit less clear. It's more of about in implementing a platform, um, but we can still make certain hypotheses a lot of the time and you've got to go with something at the end because you got to size your server so you have to make a theory and then and then adapt it um step two you know in the integration plan prioritizing the projects we tend to ask a lot of questions like you know are the workspaces ready do they already exist or is this something new that's going to have to be developed this helps with the timeline um do we know the is the data ready that we're going to need to process sometimes it's not um you know that these things uh help us in identifying uh, project priorities. But the really key thing that I want to pull out of this is it also answers the question, what data and systems are we connecting to? And this is very important. That will drive a lot of the IT considerations in the implementation of the FME server, because this um, will tell us, you know, in terms of like networking, permissions, access, database accounts, web services, you know, this will drive a lot of the configuration and setup of the FME server. So in the facets of governance and implementation, so if we start with that technology piece, now that we know what we're going to do with the FME server, so step one is what are we going to do with the FME server? For a very simple install, this is like an eight question questionnaire that we go through. And again, we list the projects, prioritize, talk about the systems, the types of automations. Now that we have that information, we can, you know, look at the licensing or, um, you know, how many engines we can look at the, uh, the hardware specs. 
Um, what do we need to provision for those engines, especially what kind of memory CPU? Because if I'm going to run a lot of a little teeny weeny like JSON based processes that are connecting two web applications together, a lot of memory might not make a lot of difference in that kind of process. Um, you know, it, you know, maybe uh, having a faster CPU will, but uh, having a lot of memory won't. However, if I'm doing, uh, you know, a few processes, but the really large like raster integrations or point cloud processing or like, you know, a lot of spatial like uh, over overlays or spatial comparisons or joining operations, maybe memory will make a big difference. So these things, you know, one FME server is not sized like another and they really need to be sort of tuned to the needs. Otherwise you end up with, you know, what I've literally seen where people have, you know, a happy FME server running long for a few years processing general town sized, you know, vector data. And then somebody decides to unpack a terabyte worth of imagery on it and uh, not thinking that um, the, the, the machine was not actually, you know, provisioned to be able to process that. So these are the things that become really uh, important in this case. Um, architecture, fault tolerance, do we need it? Do we not? We tend to do a risk at this point, we do a sort of um, a risk uh, exercise, you know, a risk management exercise, like what happens if the processes are not going to run? Uh, do we need to have fault tolerance? What is the time delay for the level of service that we need to offer for this application? Um, do we need a distributed model? Do we need um, options for scalability? So a very simple one machine FME server might do the job at the beginning, but are we planning to scale it up by a lot? Do we have our options planned and ready for scalability? Um, you know, do you know? Do we need to consider that we might end up adding a machine with engines or? you know, different kinds of scenarios like this. So we sort of go through this exercise. Again, this exercise can be very small if we're talking about a very simple little FME server, or it could be a little bit bigger if we're talking about a more complex system. The technology, uh, again, uh, we plan how we're going to install the FME server, how we're going to architect it, but we also need to think about how we're going to configure it. So how we're going to configure it, that's going to be about web services, um, you know, are there specific network requirements? Are we going to configure it with HTTPS? Are there special software dependencies? This is a very important question because whatever your FME desktop needs to run its processes, FME server will also need. So if you have special Python interpreters, if you're using something like R, if you're using special database clients, you will need to make sure that you provision your FME server with anything that the workspaces are going to need to be able to run. So we usually like to make, a, again, by knowing what we're going to do with the FME server, we can provision most of it. It doesn't mean that things won't change or that there won't be extra uh, considerations, but um, it means that, you know, if we can cover the most of the needs, then we're not at day one trying to figure out why our FME workspaces are not running on FME server. The next consideration that I think is really important is um, the people, and I think this one's been a little bit uh, overlooked. Um, so people are the ones that operate and manage the FME server. So we've done a few exercises now with different clients to identify what are the different roles and responsibilities in terms of using the FME server, uh, who's responsible for what, um, and what kind of skills are required to operate those roles and responsibilities. So what is the up training plan? And this is to provision for that idea that staff may turn over. Uh, we may uh, start including other staff and other departments on FME, uh, uh, at using FME server. And we sort of need to know what the skills necessary are to work with that. So this is sort of an example of, you know, a required competencies table uh, developed that's sort of, you know, itemizing, and this is not the full table, but it's itemizing a little bit of the difference between, you know, the FME admin versus the FME uh, author or developer role. So a lot of the, the core roles tend to fall under like, you know, the, the user roles, which only an executor, the FME author role, which is a content creator and manager, and then the FME admin, which is a system manager. Um, but sometimes in some organizations, we've also had a few additional roles that we've put in. So like, let's say an FME desktop only um, uh, creator. Uh, so it creates only FME workspaces for desktop versus somebody who has the author skills and even a sort of a solutions architect role. So it's not like we call them an FME architect role. And this person's role is more to figure out how the automation structure is going to work. So, you know, 
I, you know, we, we've done an exercise of a bit, uh, itemizing a little bit more of these roles sometimes. And then we come to the standards. So we already saw this, the sort of the technology part. And then we've seen what we do to, you know, around the people. And then there's sort of the implementation of standards and practices. So standards and practices, what we're looking at for that, um, management practices, development guide, and style and naming convention. So here we see in the style guide, we're often in the visuals. We're trying to create a visual uh, impact that is consistent and easy to use. This makes our workspaces easier to maintain over time. So it's that, that little investment at the beginning that has greater impact down the line when you're trying to understand what maybe 100 workspaces are doing or 200 workspaces are doing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's also about establishing how much annotation and good practices for the group. Also naming conventions. Desktop users don't tend to do a lot of implementation of naming conventions because they tend to open the workspace and run it a lot of the time. So they sort of know that GeoDatabase 1, GeoDatabase 2, and GeoDatabase 3, what they're pointing to. But uh, if you, you know, if you erase the pass and have all empty pass and it just says uh, source data set Excel, source data set OGC, like you see here in this graphic on the right, it, it can get confusing for somebody to know exactly what to feed the workspace in order for it to run properly if this thing is on FME server. So here I, I just put a, a nice example of one I pulled from the samples data set where, where you're seeing everything's written out nicely so that you know both the person seeing the, the prompts can understand, but even the even the published parameter itself has a easy to understand name. We also establish naming conventions around the content on FME server. And, and this has an impact because repositories are related to the security of the items. So um, you know how we divide up the repositories. Is it by group and project? So we tend to make a nomenclature. So maybe it's going to be like group underscore project. We also get into the notion of who is the owner of the content. Um, because the owner, um, because if we're a group working with workspaces, um, we, we want to know whether or not we want uh, there to be a group owner uh, whose responsibility, again, is the workspace. Then we have the development practices, and this is sort of around the shared content, the versioning, but the one I really want to point out here is really about the move to production. How do we get a process into production? On a very simple little FME server, this might be as simple as, well, you know, republish the process with under a different name and like point to the production database. It can be as simple as that. Or, it, you know, you might have a dev QA and production environment and it should be a known methodology of how to move your workspaces through those in different environments. Are you using um, projects? Um, you know, like uh, some of my clients use projects to package up the content and move it from one FME server to another. But, you know, do you have to change certain things like database names? Uh, are you going to use scripting? We, we've seen different strategies uh, for the idea of move to production. Um, and then there's the management practices. So I think it's really important to consider the idea that the FME server is not just this thing that you in install once and like walk away from. It's a thing you have to manage um, and provision for and plan. Again, when we have a very simple FME server, something like the contingency plan might be as simple as, hey, you know, if it goes out for a day, we're OK. You know, but by being used to doing the risk management, looking at the processes, what happens if there's an unplanned interruption of services? What happens if a certain workspace fails? What happens if there's a planned outage? How are those handled with IT? Who alerts who and who's responsible for making sure the FME server came back up? All these sorts of considerations should be planned for. And that way, as the FME server grows, we're able to plan for it better. We're sort of already in the practice of planning for this. Um, I do want to point out that in the last um, year or so, SAFE has been adding a lot of like statistics, um, the amount of CPU time, the average running time for workspaces, the number of times the schedules have run. These things are very handy in that day-to-day -day tracking of the performance of the FME server. So whoever's responsibility is that. And you know, the method, the management plan should also include a method for prioritization. So if I have a limited number of engines and I have five groups using the FME server, somebody wants to run a job every one minute, do they get a dedicated engine? Like who decides that? You know, we, we have to decide those things and we have to, we have to make a plan. And again, I'm really pro the idea of growing the need to the business needs and then evolving it as we need to. 
um, because the needs will change over time. Security considerations, uh, we're looking at user security, application security, and data security. So in the user security, we're looking at uh, really considering on the authors here. Like this is where I want to point out that you may need more than one author role if your FME server is serving different groups of users. And this is because authors can create and manage content. So if you give them access to all the content, then they have access to to all the data. So if you're you know using F depending on how you're using FME server and how you do security in your organization, you do need to consider that. You should have a plan on how to add and revoke user privileges if you need to. And please do not use lose the super user password. Please keep it somewhere safe. You don't know how many people have actually come to me because they've locked themselves somehow out of their FME server. Um, application security. There are lots of options. I reread the uh, FME Server Administrator's Guide every year to uh, see what's new and different in the security uh, recommendations, the security settings. So there's some settings that are interesting for encryption, HTTPS, and review it's important to keep reviewing these options because they do evolve over time. Then the last thing I want to say is data security. You have to match your user practices and your user security to the security of your data. That's important. The things, they all have to line up because you don't want to create a, you know, a security gap in how you're managing your data. So the key takeaways, business needs are the main driver for how you're going to manage your FME server, how you're going to size it, um, how complex your plan is going to be. Um, make an integration roadmap. Know what you plan to do with the FME server. It's, it's, a, it's a living document, so what you can do is you can keep adding to it or reprioritizing as you need, but it'll give you an idea of where you're going and you know the three main facets of governance. So with that information, with your roadmap, with your business needs, you'll be able to match your technology and your people and your standards to the right practices. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me. And uh, thank you for listening. Welcome to this presentation. Uh, well, I'll be talking about enabling CAD upload to WebGIS. My name is Lars Nielsen. I work as a software developer with the company Leafa. Uh, I'm a certified FME professional and I manage the company FME installation as well, which consists of two FME servers and a desktop. I also do a lot of uh, database programming in the SQL Server and uh, Python programming for FME and for uh, QGIS. I'll be talking about uh, our small project of enabling uh, CAD upload to the WebGIS. Uh, we realized that we had an internal need for uploading CAD files into the general purpose WebGIS uh, of our company. And we also realized that external customers that use our WebGIS uh, also had that need so uh, the goal was to, to create uh, an automated addition of CAD data into the WebGIS and uh, it was to be initiated directly by the WebGIS user. The success criteria uh, is to display the uploaded CAD data in a familiar and recognizable form. So the colors need to be the same and, and styles, etc. Uh, and this, this is what we are tr trying to achieve. The development of the project is, is divided into steps. And the first step that we've uh, implemented uh, is uploading CAD files without any external attribute data. Uh, and this is uh, reserved for, for AutoCAD data. Uh, in uh, DWG or DXF file formats. And the second step will be to enable uh, uploading CAD files with uh, external database attributes. Uh, this is for internal use, uh, at least at first. Um, and it's for, for microstation design files only. 
And the final step would be to consider if, if we need to add other formats and file types to the mix. Lastly, I'll talk about some of the challenges we met on the way and how we solved them. And uh, I'll finally try to conclude and, and tell about what we've learned. The general problem with CAT is that it's typically stuck in CAT environment only. Uh, CAT vendors have been making viewers available, but they're not really good and they are not necessarily good at joining other kinds of data with it, together with the CAT data. So we wanted to, to utilize our general WebGIS platform and enable uh, ad adding CAT data to it without any problem, so to speak. Um, and the benefits from, from this approach would be that all the, the, the possible uh, benefits that we have in our normal WebGIS would be available to to the, the CAT people as well, uh, when they can upload the data and use the data in the normal fashion in the WebGIS. So how did we set out to bridge that gap? Well, the first uh, step was to create an easy upload mechanism in our WebGIS that uh, enabled the user to, to upload the files. That was fairly easy to make. The next step was to process the uploaded files automatically. And this is where FME comes in. The third step was to merge the data into the WebGIS layers. And this is done by a separate process that runs uh, every uh, two minutes uh, and checks for, for newly uploaded data. I'll get back to that. Uh, and lastly, Again, uh, we want uh, to display the data as close to the CAT styling experience as possible. This slide shows the entire workflow in a, in a simple form. Um, on the left, you have the CAT file input, either AutoCAD or Bentley MicroStation. Or, and uh, our WebGIS uh, uploads the upload the files directly to FME server, which processes them and saves them in a temporary location in a database. And after that, the second process takes over and imports the data that has been uploaded into the WebGIS layers. I've made a small video to show how it works in practice. This is our WebGIS where I choose the upload function and the dialog box comes up where I choose the first the projection of the CAT file. Uh, and lastly, I choose the CAT file to be uploaded and the upload starts immediately. After the upload has been done, all you have to do is wait, redraw the layer. Data hasn't been imported yet, but after a while, maximum two minutes, you redraw the layer and the data has been added automatically. Now you can use the normal information tool in the WebGIS to access the attributes of the data that has been uploaded. Here you see the workspace that handles the upload. On the left, you see the AutoCAD reader here that receives the CAT file and processes it. Uh, this is the projection magic going on here. And finally, uh, eventually it ends up here in the writer that writes out a database table, which you can see have a timestamp on it 
in order to minimize problems with in a multi-user environment. And lastly, you have the, uh, it adds an entry into a control table that designates the table for as new and ready to be imported. On the right here, you see parameters to the workspace, and these are more or less the same that you can set in the upload dialog in the web GIS. They are transferred directly to the workspace. The workspace has been uploaded to FME server, taking advantage of the data streaming capabilities, where we designate the AutoCAD reader as the input to receive the streaming the streaming input to receive the the cat file and then process it directly the challenges we've met uh, along the way was first of all to understand how fme server streaming functions because this is not necessarily as, as easy as as it seems uh, workspaces can be called in many different ways in, on FME server and some support streaming input, some support streaming output, some support both and some support neither. So we needed or we had to learn how to call the workspace in exactly the right way to, to get what we wanted. The next thing that we needed to handle was the cat in triggers hope that's pronounced correctly, uh, because CAT uh, contains a lot of, of, of pitfalls, uh, among them colors and cells, but luckily FME helps a lot with that. Colors in a CAT file is uh, typically an index into a color table that we don't have. But luckily FME translates the color uh, into a, a more sensible format that we can uh, rework into uh, an RGB color. Cells are the equivalent of symbols in GIS, but uh, uh, the data itself is just uh, a point. So if we just import them, it just uh, gets a point, gets us a point that no one can see. But luckily uh, FME uh, enables uh, exploding the cells. So we get the, the visual appearance of the symbol. The last uh, intricacy we had or have is that there's really no uh, distinguishing between geographic and cosmetic data in, in a CAD file. If a CAD file include a legend, uh, the legend will come across as a geographic data just the same as anything else in the CAD file. Uh, we really haven't found a way to distinguish those uh, because they are bas basically just in any layer and with any. There's no, no tagging of the, the cosmetic data in CAD. And lastly, again, we are looking forward to supporting database attribute data. Uh, at first, at least for internal use and for, for design file use only. But uh, that's the next step in our project. So to conclude on all of this, although it is a challenging task to bridge the CAT and, and GIS uh, gap, it's not impossible. So don't uh, be discouraged, uh, just uh, solve the issues along the way. And uh, FME server streaming capabilities makes it easy to add more uh, formats to the mix because you basically just need to add another uh, workspace uh, with a different reader. And then you have another upload capable uh, workspace. Uh, our next project uh, is to uh, utilize the streaming output functionality of, of FME server we want uh, the WebGIS user to be able to download a small CAT file uh, uh, from something they have selected in the WebGIS. So we're looking forward to trying that out. There was 
all from me. Thank you for listening in. Uh, I hope you can find some inspiration in our, our little project. Uh, thank you again.